Hello. Hey, good morning and welcome back to on third day of international conference about climate crisis, uh, ecological crisis, theater and philosophy, which organized by uh, BITEF uh, with cooperation with Zajedničko. Uh, and this morning we will start with uh, degrowth, with talk uh, about degrowth, but I will make some small reflection on previous days. Uh, we mentioned in previous days a lot of times limits, limits of people and limits of nature and limits of the planet. Uh, and we are mentioning several times also extra, uh, extravagant uh, economy and uh, what it's bringing and how much resource we are using uh, and how mo modern society is in love uh, with growth and how do this infinity growth is our final purpose or something like that. But also when you ask people that they much more appreciate free time and time spent with friends than time spent uh, with spending of money and using uh, resources. and. Also, we mentioned how we need to slow down and uh, degrowth is giving some solution how to slow down and how to live better in society without growth because mostly people uh, connect this. If it's, there is no growth, it will be a recession, but degrowth is something totally different than a recession. And today about degrowth, we'll speak uh, Vincent. Uh, Vincent is coming from France, but he's uh, based in uh, Budapest. Uh, he's a researcher and engineer, and uh, he, he published some books. You can see the uh, newest one. It's his co-author of a book, Exploring Degrowth, and, and then this other one in French. Uh, I'm not really good with, with French, Decroissants. Decroissants, uh, sorry. Uh, and floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Vedran. Hello, everybody. So first, I would like to uh, very warmly thank all the organizers for this fantastic festival and the uh, great time I had the opportunity to spend with you since, uh, since I arrived. And I think it's uh, such a great idea to have these discussions here next to a market when you see people coming, listening, going out, and so on, and with us. And, and, um, and to speak about a very, very tense topics degrowth. Uh, it's very tense because it's addressing uh, a lot of problems, and I could observe it in the last days, which are creating more and more fears. Uh, I've just read this morning uh, a new survey in France showing that 70% uh, of the younger people are, feel like uh, totally frightened and hopeless toward the situation with climate change and biodiversity loss. And I had the feeling that all around the panel's discussion, the discussion I had with uh, some of you in the last two days, it's, it's very here. It's very here emotionally and so on. And um, even if we, we all agree that we need to change, we all agree that we need to go out of capitalism, we all agree that we should um, decolonize our imaginary and slow down, as you said, we should reconsider our relationship toward work and so on, we are a bit blocked. And what we did with Degros, the story started 20 years ago in France, it's to try to find a tool which will be helping us to start to initiate the transformation, the radical transformation what we have to implement. And um, this transformation we have to do, it's a paradigm switch. And historically, to make such a paradigm switch, it's something which takes several generations or centuries. And here, no, I would say we have less than 10 years to really implement major transformation. So 20 years ago, and it will be my... Uh, my first point uh, about how we created a tool to not be raped anymore. I mean, our imaginary is daily raped by advertisement, by mass media, by this dominant system which is pushing us, which is manipulating our desires um, by very, very smart, brilliant, creative people working for marketing. And uh, they are like some of you here today, uh, brilliant artists. And artists have this capacity to uh, touch our heart, to, to touch us. And these artists are using their skills with psychologists, with experts in social psychology, in sociology, in um, cognitive sciences, in neurosciences, and so on, to really go inside our brain, to play with us 
with frustration, with fears, with uh, infantilization, to, to, to steal our dreams, to steal our hopes, and so on. And when we founded, when we decided to use this word degrowth, it was really to have a provocative slogan, something which is counterintuitive in this dominant narrative, where everything is always about more, bigger, stronger, quicker, etc., etc. So we wanted a word which directly, in its semantic, emotionally, intellectually, attack what is in the heart of the system, growth, economy growth. And the main idea also behind, and it turned out 20 years after that it was a brilliant idea and it was an argument coming from somebody who used to be a project manager in one of the biggest French uh, marketing corporation, was also to have a word what you cannot rape or you cannot uh, empty from its content, that you cannot co-opt, that you cannot reappropriate. And in the last 20 years, it's impossible to list how many wonderful ideas, words, concepts, sometimes driven by manipulative, cynical people, but most of the time driven by sincere people, which have been co-opted, which have been taken by the system. That Nowadays, you go to a supermarket in Western Europe. I don't know here because I haven't gone to a supermarket here, but I did last week in Paris. In you would find more or less exactly the same type of products or even sometimes more extractivist products, more polluting products, more expo exploitative products and so on. But all the slogans behind, all the colors what they use, all the packaging what you will see and so on, stole one after the other one a lot of concepts which were developed around our movements like solidarity, like fair trade, like organic, bio, like... Um, uh, convivial. I saw more and more in France convivial products, like made by made like by your grandma, local, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course they are not, but they steal everything. Until now, degrowth protect us for being stolen, and we have a tool around a world around which we can find each other with very very clear statements. Where nowadays, when you buy an organic product, you don't know anymore. Is it really organic? When was it produced? In what kind of condition? Is it really a type of product which is regenerating biodiversity? Are they exploiting people? How much it traveled? We don't know that. Where in the beginning, in organic principle, you have the same type of principle than you find in degrowth. So that was the main idea to have this tool. And through this tool, it's like a provocation to initiate a debate. On one hand, to remind everybody for the fact that infinite growth on a finite planet is physically, environmentally, energetically impossible. Nowadays, we have all the scientific elements which show that this model is driving us quicker and quicker to uh, uh, terrible tragedies. But we already s see more and more. The frequencies and intensity of tragedies are increasing. We saw it in a very spectacular way again this summer. But it's not only about the physical limits to growth. And I would say it's even more about the cultural limits to growth. Because the richer you are, the more stupid you are. Because the more you go in a rich society, the more life is commodified, the more human interactions are broken. The more inequalities are exploding. The more violence is there. The more authoritarianism, and with this COVID and the uh, sanitary pass, when I'm back from Paris, are coming everywhere. I know you need to have a mobile phone, install an app just to sit on a terrace to have a coffee with a friend. And the more you live in this type of society, also the more your job is emptied from its meanings. Like you work for a big corporation, you will have to do, even with a good position, which is a privileged position. And it was said by of one of the person yesterday, we condemned more, the more the society is rich, the more you condemn for non-ethical life. And degrowth is about the physical limits to growth, but it's mostly about the cultural limits to growth and to question, what do we really need? What are our basic needs to be happy in life, to have a meaningful life? And how do we fulfill them? In a sustainable way, of course, but mostly in a fair, transparent, inclusive, sharing, convivial, autonomous way. So that's the first point I wanted to, to develop, degrowth as a semantic tool, provocative slogan, which cannot be co-opted by the system, where we can reappropriate our hopes, dreams, 
and we are clearly saying what we have to say. We are not saying that, yeah, green growth could help, or green technologies, or green capitalism. No, we have to get out of this system. The second point, and degrowth was born, one of these guys from marketing and criticizing how man advertisement is manipulating us, met with old activists and intellectuals and academics from Global South and Global North, we were criticizing the imposture of development. And development, it's another tool which ripes the imaginary. It's an imperialistic tool which was implemented after the Second World War to keep on going with colonialism, with a beautiful world. Development is that idea that you have countries which are developed. Us, I mean, as a French, I belong to that. Western, Western Europe, United States. And you have countries who are so idiots that they are late. They have to catch back. They are underdeveloped. So they should follow the same model of civilization. They should follow the same trends. And why doing so? It's pretext to keep on doing what's happened for decades. Extractivism, exploitation of global south, exploitation of people, to be able to reach this illusion of comfort in global north with an environmental footprint which is unsustainable. And it was very important for us to go back to that, because why criticizing development? And it started, maybe Degro started in a large conference in UNESCO in Paris in 2002, and the name was Deconstruct or Destroy Development, Rebuild the World. And what was very important since the beginning of the Degros Network that all this narrative, all these debates, all this experimentation are made in connections with Global South. And I would say that without Global South, what's happened with, my, with me and my friends in Global North, without traveling there, without analyzing what's happened in the past and how did we enter into this dominant dogma around growth, without meeting with them, it will have been very, very, very difficult to deconstruct our bias, to deconstruct uh, our narrow reductionist view of what is good life. So thanks to them and keep on going with them. So that was the second point I wanted to, to develop and uh, today we are in a so-called semi-periphery country. And as we often say that when you are engaged in a, in a street which is in accelerating, pushing you quicker and quicker to, the, to a, a big catastrophe. I would say the, the more you are late with that dynamic, the more you are in a better position. So semi-peripheric is in a much better position from a lot of perspective, and I think Laden will speak about that after. He's reading his newspaper, but he will. And it, I would say the same. If you go to Global South, and we're here in the Global North, we speak about uh, food sovereignty, we speak about family farming, we speak about informal solidarities, we speak about conviviality, we speak about um, low tech. And when I am in Budapest, it's my, my small alternative, doing with a lot of difficulties because I was not educated to do that, trying to reconstruct very basic good sense things in our human interaction with local food production, our cargo bikes, our low tech, low -tech stuff rethinking, reinventing reciprocity economy, and I have Le Monde, uh, academics coming to visit us, being amazed with what we do, I feel totally ashamed, because you go anywhere else in the past, or in other civilizations, they are doing it every day naturally. But now we are the new heroes in the Western world about that. And we need to have these radical critics to development and to create the links with Global South, because we have a lot to learn from them. We have to lo a lot to learn with what development destroyed in our imaginary, in our societies and cultures. So that was my second point. My third point, because there were a lot of questions um, and debates, and I, and I felt not so many answers in the last two days about that, degrowth is also a political project. It's a political project with political strategy, political strategy on how to change the world without taking the power. Because if you take power, moreover, in institutions which were designed to do exactly the contrary to degrowth, you will be taken by the power. But without taking power doesn't mean that we should let the power in the hands 
of Macron or Orban. So it's more about how to create cultural dynamics, how to create resistance, how to create uh, um, political movements to say no to this dominant system and to invent parallelly new ways to practice degrowth. Very often I say that if there is only one word you could uh, substitute degrowth, and it also starts with a D, is democracy. And I think it's one of the key challenge of degrowth strategies. It's how to rethink, how to revive our democracies. And democracy is not only limited to a democratic tool, which can be effective and useful for certain type of decision, which is the only tool what we have in this democratic liberal narrative, which is the election, party system, representative democracy. So again, it can be useful, but it's far away from being enough. You know, democracy, it's a culture. It's a daily practice. Democracy is something we should take back with a lot of creativity. And in France, in the last years, following the Yellow Vest movement, the Yellow Vest movement started with, I believe, a manipulation with a fake ecological tax, which was an unfair task targeting the people who are poorer in the countryside in France in order to make them pissed off and turn them against the green because the green were growing politically and push them to the Front National, to the uh, far right. And somehow, something happened. People started to block crossroads all around the country, but they did something what we stopped doing in our Western civilization. They met and they talk. And one of the key words which emerged of from this yellow vest movement was fraternity, which should be one of the basic one on which the French society is constructed. Because in France, in the countryside, you don't have local bars anymore. You don't have social socializing places anymore. And suddenly they recreated these social bars. They're creating forum, what we have here today. And they started to talk. And they started because they are not more stupid than you or me. They started to understand that they were put in a trap. Why rejecting these ecological taxes, the dominant system, Paris, the elite, the oligarchy, wanted to mock them, wanting to look down at them, saying, look, look at that idiot, they still want to pollute with their car. Whereas they are taken into the trap to depend on a car, because you don't have job, you need to, to drive every day 100 kilometers just to make your job. You need to drive 40 kilometers just to get bread, because we, it, it's empty. There is no socialization and so on. And of course, when the movement started to politicize and started to be a political force, incredible police repression started. And we found a way to stop this violence, with people who lost eyes, who lost hands, who lost feet, people who ended up in jail, whose life is destroyed, and also people who died under the police violence. And we decided to implement, with a lot of creativity, a new tool based on randomly chosen citizen, a convention. And we implemented the Citizen Convention for Climate, where 150 people were randomly chosen. Even among some of my friends in Paris connected to degrowth or green left movements, they were more than skeptical in the beginning. Say, OK, why do you want to do that? Why do you want 150 people to democratically, transparently work on such issues? Well, our experts already made the job, and we know what we have to do. Mladen, a good expert, know what we have to do, for example. And the other one, we're also reacting, and you can see how we integrated a lot of, a lot of uh, hatred and a lot of looking down at the people. A lot of other ones say, among these 150 people, there are so much idiots that they will end up with death penalty. We ask them about how to implement social and environmental justice, they will end up with death penalty. Or they will end up with, uh, uh, we need to buy more TV screen and so on. And what's happened was what we always claimed in the beginning in degrowth, we should implement or reinvent democracy. They ended up with 150 proposals interconnected with each other, which could be what we've been writing for two decades in our degrowth book, and very smart. And no other experts in France made such a brilliant job. And they did it only in seven weekends. And it's an evidence that if you put on the table the right question and you have time for the people in respecting them and responsabilizing them, you find a way to handle all the conflictualities and potentially violent conflictualities 
what we have now to make the transformation what we need. So, tactically, strategically, degrowth is about democracy. But parallelly, we also have a lot of proposals which could help democracy to, to be active. And one main approach would be and should be first how to re embed the economy. Because one of the main blockades, one of the main tools which is alienating the society is the economy. Because I need money to pay for my accommodation, to pay by my loan, what I, I contracted for uh, my studies. I need money to, uh, for my children. I need money for my food and so on. I need to accept the bullshit job. I need to accept the job which is humiliating me or the job which is nonsense, which is making me depressed or even more, the job where I will be pushed to do exactly the contrary to what we have to do. I, I am an engineer and most of my colleagues who were graduated in the same time as me, they have to work in the military industrial complex or car industry. And when I talk to them face to face around the beer, they are not like, it's so fantastic to construct tanks and helicopters and to sell it to Saudi Arabia or to, uh, to Victor Orban. Nobody is happy to wake up to do that, but they have to. So we need to find tools on how we put back the economy in the right place. How we go out of this religion of the economics, which is imposing a sway of life and decisions which are stupid, which are toxic, which are accelerating with exploitation of global south, with extractivism and exploitation of people, and which are emptying everybody for meaningful life. So we develop different type of tools, and I will just mention a few, and after I will conclude. Uh, of course, one of the main tools where we started to implement discussions were unconditional basic income. But unconditional basic income, like any other tool, can be used for very good purposes or can also be totally counterproductive toward the degrowth political project. So it has to be connected to other proposals. The second one that we connected it with was maximum income. So we need to recreate societies saying that there is no level under which we abandon anybody. It should be a human right that everybody has an access to the minimum for a decent life, unconditionally. But also we should reappropriate the sense of the limits, maximum income. Because obviously first, the way of life of the richest people are unsustainable and it's not possible to spread it to all because it's already, we are already over the capacity of the planet to, to sustain our way of life. So even less of the richest and the richest as the richer you are, the, the, more, the higher is your responsibility in the problem we face in the society. But it's even more important for symbolic reason to reappropriate the sense of the limit and to self-implement maximum income. It's a way to break this narrative what I started to speak about with advertisement, mass media, and so on, that to be somebody, to have a successful life, to be happy, you have to be like a richest person, one of the richest person. You need a yacht, you need a helicopter, you need this way of life. And symbolically, we need to kill this message. And also, when you, s you look at the psychological social studies about the richest people, they are far away from being the happiest people. Usually, they are very paranoid, because when you are very rich, you don't have any sane human interaction anymore, you, you have only predators around you. So I would say help, be generous, you know, we have to be generous and empathic in the transformation. So help these very rich people who are very sad and who are killing us, uh, liberate them for what they have. So it's also what we know about rising inequalities, no, it's not only about income, it's also about, um, it's also about uh, uh, patrimony, or how do you say in English, uh, what you own, the, your wealth. It's a uh, so it's also about how to rethink property rights. How to rethink property rights where nowadays property rights is going against the common interest. It's blocking us to self-organize transition, self-organize how do we uh, fulfill our basic needs and so on. So around that you have two main approaches. One is about how to put out of the logic of the market what is too important for survival to be let in the irrationality of the so-called rationality of the market or the economy. It's what we call the extension of the free access of public services and some basic goods. So free access to a certain number of liters. 
for free, free access of um, health for all, free access to education, the school of life for all. But if it's to only give a free access without questioning what is health, what is education, what is a school, uh, how do we produce the water what we have and for what kind of purposes, it's nonsense. So this logic around the commons, it's also to rethink democracy and to create dynamics of public deliberation in the territories around themes to question what are our basic needs around water and how do we fulfill it? What are our basic needs about health? How do we fulfill it? Do we want to live in a society like in Western Europe with uh, unsustainable high tech consuming a lot of energy with a lot of waste? Uh, medical system to cure disease, which are the consequences of the industrial society, what we implemented to make this high-tech medical system work? Or do we want to go back to what Hippocrates said? Your medicine will be your, uh, your, your food. So to rethink the way of life that we are not sick anymore. We are not stressed and we get cancer anymore. We are not eating a lot of junk food and we create uh, the disease of the Western civilization where in the global south one billion are suffering of lack of food and in the global north we eat too much meat, too fat, too salty and we die, uh, or we don't die yet. We have to invest in a lot of energy and raw material but we still go to lose for global south toward that. So the idea around the commons and re-embed the economy is also about um, rethink democracy around that, implement, be creative in all the type of democratic governance of the commons. One more point, it's about, and it's a theme which disappeared and we should go back to that, it's to implement public, transparent, participatory, public audits of the debts, economic, public, private debts, to scrutinize what's happened, like in France, we know very well that the, the public debt that we have, it's because some private bank who loaned just printed money from um, the public bank, the central bank, made interest and got rich on that interest. And now we are just saying we cannot repay the nurses properly because we have to pay back uh, this debt, which is a mafia system. But the private debt is even more problematic. All the large companies making profit, no, were constructed in, in debt. A company like Uber, which destroys the life of a lot of taxi drivers, where we, we should have rethink if we need taxi and cars and so on, but it was incredibly violent. It's even not making profit, it's only making bigger and bigger debt to make more and more money for a minority. And we should have public audits about this type of things. But when we speak about debt, it's also about ecological debt. It's also about uh, responsibility, what the global north has towards the global south, with colonization, with slavery, with um, political imperialism, political interference, and so on. So we should go toward these things. And when we speak about this debt, it's also about ecofeminism. Eco How do we rethink our patriarchal societies and so on? So I will stop here because I'm more interested in your comments and questions and I could uh, speak for five hours about degrowth, but this is a discussion. And degrowth, I, I presented uh, three main lines, how to reappropriate our desire in going out of advertisement and having a tool which is protected from the manipulation and defining in decolonizing our imaginary, defining clearly what we have to do, reappropriate hope and and our dreams, radical critics to development, and how to re-embed the economy, but I could have developed a lot of other type of concepts, ideas, theories, school of thoughts, like conviviality and Ivan Illich, like uh, how to rethink work in our society with centrality of work with, for example, Andre Goss, like uh, autonomy with Cornelius Castoriadis, how to really rethink what is a real democratic society how to self-implement our own laws and so on. Uh, I could have developed eco ecofeminism, but I'm not legitimate as a white male from Western Europe to so much speak about that, and I don't understand much. I'm still, I'm still learning about it, and it was really well presented in a lot of other panels since then. 
And, and degrowth is how to connect all these discussions, all these themes. It's also about um, how to connect the transformation in our societies, which is underway. It's not so much visible yet, but maybe Mladen will speak about it after. I, I will just give you a few examples because I'm just back from Paris and from France. Uh, on the contrary to what the mass media and mass politicians keep on repeating for years, where on TV in France in the last 20 years, when you speak about degrowth, it's only to demonize the people who speak about degrowth. And you always have this narrative that maybe they are right from an environmental point of view is what we should do. We don't have the choice. But as the people don't want it, we cannot. And on the contrary to this mantra from in the mass media, all the last surveys in Western Europe, in France, are showing that no, the large majority of the populations don't believe anymore in green capitalism, in green growth, in green technologies, in green transition toward this uh, big fake news lies of uh, renewable or uh, clean energy or smart technology or smart inclusive green growth and so on. Like the last study made in France, it was made by the unions of the big bosses and big corporation called the MEDEF. And they are very pissed off with the result, showing that 67% of the people in France don't believe anymore in this system. Second point, the society all around the world is already full of solutions which are already here. Uh, it's already full of a lot of things what our mainstream way of understanding the society makes invisible, like um, maybe the large majority of the most important task for our well-being in uh, all our Western societies in all around the world are made outside of the logic of paid employment, outside of the logic what, of what you calculate in GDP. So it's invisible. Friendship, caring about each other, informal solidarities were put invisible. But that's already a basic point that we should put visible and we should promote on which we can construct the rules. Also, you have a lot of creativity with a lot of wonderful movements and local initiatives all around the world experimenting in low scale because I think small is beautiful and we will have also to change our mindset. We shouldn't have um, uh, an extension or a development of that small scale initiative, but on the contrary, we should have uh, an horizontal uh, scale up of this type of initiative around small is beautiful, uh, small entities rethinking human interaction and democracy. So you have all these wonderful dynamics happening. And you have more and more tough debates about the rules. And I'm not sure that it's a good idea, but I accepted the, the invitations, what I get more and more and more that also the leaders, the people who are the key uh, people in this system start to understand that there is something wrong. And in the last two or three years, I started to be more and more invited by people where I used to be civil disobedience action against, big bosses of last corporation, entrepreneurs, banks, and they are lost as well. Because before being an employee of these large polluters, which are the key point of the problem, they are also citizens. And very often, they are citizens who have children, who are around like 15 year olds, and who are belonging with this new generation who totally understood emotionally that we are facing frightening things. And they are attacking their parents, and their parents don't understand what's happening. In their families, there was a tradition to go each generation to this elite school, and to reproduce the domination of the society. And suddenly, the daughter is speaking about ecofeminism and uh, attacking the father. Why do you take an helicopter to go to hunt? You are a fucking bastard, Papa. It's what's happening now. And it's pushing the society to change and so on. And also, because they are good entrepreneurs and businessmen, they understood that the people don't want to buy anymore their toxic products. So they have to change. If not, they go to bankruptcy. So it's a lot of things which makes me think that we are very close already, or maybe we already have the critical mass of people ready to change. And we didn't find yet, but we are working on that, on that. We didn't find yet how to politically transform this cultural transformation in democratic, serein transformations. And I don't say transformation in singular, I say transformations in plural, 
towards a large diversity of societies, of social organizations, which will be based on a lot of other wonderful principles like care, like ecofeminism, like conviviality, like autonomy, like direct democracy, like uh, small is beautiful, like uh, uh, the right to be lazy, etc., uh, etc. Et so degrowth is this platform, this matrix of thought, which is uh, trying to help something which is already happening in our society. And we hope will be quicker and quicker, and we face a growth crisis as soon as possible, because if not, we will be forced to do it, and we have this slogan that, no, the, the solution is between degrowth of barbarity. Castoriadis, in the beginning of the 1950s, spoke about socialism of barbarity, and no, it's degrowth of barbarity. So it's chosen democratically organized degrowth, or uh, um, violent recession, followed by uh, collapse of our condition of life, what we know in this planet. So thank you for your attention. OK, I, I have some question for you. Uh, and then I, I will give mic to other people. Uh, for me, it's interesting. I completely agree uh, on what you are talking. But how to introduce degrowth into mainstream politics? Uh, I know that you work and some other people from degrowth movement also work with the European Parliament and with some parliamentarian groups. And uh, I think it's going pretty slow because still they are in love with the green growth. And it's also for me here, at least in Serbia, when I talk with some friends who are coming from left side, as some, uh, even Greens, uh, they will tell you, yeah, we agree with you, but this is political suicide if you talk about green uh, degrowth uh, in public space or something, uh, when you want to have more voters. How to change that? So the political suicide, and we already seen it a lot of time with a lot of good friends who uh, managed to win election in going hidden. So if you go with a narrative that I have to be positive because we were so much uh, conditioned to think in a positive way, uh, with advertisement, etc., and political narrative. So the, sui the suicidal political suicide, it's to go hidden, to have in the mind to implement degrowth when you win the power in proposing something else. And we already saw that you're taken back by the power and you don't implement much. You face a lot of contradiction and so on. For years, with a lot of other friends, we tried to push our friends to be honest with themselves and to be honest with the society and to, to, to make a coming out. Yeah, we are degrowth and that's the only solution. We have all the scientific evidence knows that the narrative of green growth is a fake news, is a manipulation. So stop talking about that. We know very well that all this narrative about smart technologies, about green technologies, green cars, etc., is only deporting the problem somewhere else is only instead of exploiting this territory and these people you go to exploit another territory and other people and instead of facing depletion of oil we will face depletion of water and whatsoever so now we have all the evidence about that and now i've just back from paris where i'm totally exhausted because i i've been running for two weeks from one media to another one because uh, there was a woman who used to be um, a socialist party member who uh, when she was a socialist party member like me when i was a left Alter globalist activist in the 2000s. I didn't understand much about environment. She was um, dealing with uh, security, which is far away from degrowth and so on. But uh, Hollande decided to hire her as a minister of environment. And as a minister of environment, because she's a serious politician, she made the job and she realized that I'm blocked. Within this institution and narrative, we cannot take any serious decision towards the ch and ecological challenges what we face. So she resigned. We had a long series of wonderful resignation of Ministry of Minister of Environment in France in the last year, and each time with the same narrative that we have to go to degrowth, it doesn't work like that, and so on. And her, she went even further. I know she's participated. She's one of the five candidates of the primary election of the ecologist parties in France, which got quite a large media coverage and um, with incredible audience, like one of the debates for more than two hours where the 
key point of the debate was degrowth. Two million people watch it. I know a lot of people are participating, voting today, so I don't make any pronostic because uh, I don't know, uh, I forgot who said that uh, to make a pronostic is to explain the day after why you were wrong the day before, so I won't uh, take this risk. But it's already a victory what she did because speaking about it pushed first the media to speak about it and created a lot of dynamics within the society where I can see based on how I've been harassed and all of my friends dealing with Digon have been harassed by medias and citizens and, and being invited everywhere in the last days, which shows that people are expecting that. And when she decided to do it, all her advisors were telling her, don't speak about degrowth, you will commit suicide. And maybe she commits suicide now in this primary election. But if she would have won the primary election with green growth, it was even more a bigger suicide. And it's what we should say to our friends. The main goal is not to change the institution. The main goal is to prove that we have the cultural critical mass behind degrowth. And maybe when it will be proved, we will be able to be free and go back to fish or garden or care about our children because the uh, idiots who like the power will implement it instead of us because it will be the narrative what they implement. And the politicians, mainstream politicians usually, they, they don't have any ideas. They do what they push to do. So I would uh, say to uh, everybody who want to enter into politics, be yourself, be sincere. Don't go with fake news thinking that people will be happier with the fake news. But tell the truth and people will understand the truth and will follow you. Thank you, Van San, for this uh, inspiring uh, lecture. I have a question and comment uh, related to this uh, rising popularity of the degrowth movement that we witnessed in the last uh, six or seven years. And today one can find lots of uh, biennials dedicated to the degrowth uh, team or museums are claiming that they are making a degrowth uh, program. So my question is, how do you comment on this immense popularity of the degrowth? And uh, could this be also a sign of a certain kind of cooptation or kind of, uh, let's say, cultural culturalization of the degrowth? And what are the strategies to kind of tackle it? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a very important point. So till now, what was designed to be a protection toward this cooptation, Till now, till today, maybe tomorrow it will change, worked. But we can see how uh, social greenwashing also became uh, eco-feminist washing. It will sooner or later, they, they will sell more, more and more and more products in the name of eco-feminism. Now, uh, LGBTQ movement is also co-opted more and more. How a lot of movements toward us is co-opted, like uh, fair trade, which was initiated by very nice people who were working with. You know, you buy something with a fair trade labelization, you don't really know what's behind. And it's become a business as usual like the other one. So we still believe that uh, uh, a degrowth SUV is not so sexy. And, and maybe tomorrow when they will, and, and the fact that they are using uh, all our s other slogans shows that we have the critical mass because advertisements, they are smart. I mean, are designed with uh, uh, social scrut scrutiny of what the people and their mindsets. So now they sell convivial SUV. I mean, when they sell you an SUV, the advertisement, it's not about you being in normal usage of SUV, going to work and being in the traffic jam. It's you being with your family to go to ride bicycle in the forest, which is really interesting. Well, that's a degrowth narrative used to still sell the things and so on. And, um, and, and I think that the fact that we had this world which protected us gave us 20 years to have a wonderful collective work internationally and to construct very consistent theoretical background, strategy, and political projects. So now, on the contrary to other concepts which were vague because they didn't want to shock too much, um, you don't have any clear narrative. If I tell you post-growth, there is no theory of post-growth. There are people who will say, no, but I say post-growth, but I am degrowth. There are people who will say that, ah, I say post-growth, but uh, I believe in smart, in smart growth, which is not growth anymore, but it's still growth. Sustainable development was everything in its country. Degrowth, no, even uh, only if you are totally dishonest, you take only two minutes to go to Wikipedia or to take any book and so on, you will see that there is a very clear, strong pillars of a theoretical background. 
And I think this 20 years, and I hope we won't be co-opted so soon, or maybe if we are co-opted very soon, it means that we already won and we don't need degrowth anymore and we should go to, to something else. This 20 years gave us this chance to really precise and co-construct with a lot of friends all around the world, something which I think cannot be co-opted because we don't have only the cement thing which is going against the system and pushing you to decolonize your imaginary. We also have all the background, all the content, which is radically transforming the society. Hi, Vincent, thank you for the talk. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. The first one being, uh, are we too late? Uh, because um, actually you've sent me that study, no, that article that the KPMG, one of the top bosses in KPMG uh, actually reviewed a MIT study of, the, uh, of, of their models of, of uh, how systems will grow in the future from the 70s, and we're on track to the disaster models uh, already. And uh, the growth effect effectually will stop in 2035, whatever growth that is. And in my opinion, that means just um, system destruction, because I don't think we are ready for that. And my and uh, the se second question is, um, in your in your opinion, why do you think the media in France is giving so much cover? I mean, you partially did answer this question, but I kind of see that you know, in uh, I don't know how it is in France, but I'm, I'm assuming that everywhere, as, as it is everywhere, you know, you have large media conglomerates which are being dominated by capital. So I, I'm just wondering how come, you know, this is getting a word out in the, in the media when it's, when it's totally, like you'd say, I mean, I'd say anti-capitalist anti movement. Yeah, so uh, first question, yeah, we are too late. I mean, uh, and we know it. Uh, a peaceful, slow, step-by-step -step democratic transformation of our imaginaries and societies could have been implemented in the 1960s, 70s, where we were already debating what we debate now. I mean, uh, degrowth didn't invent much. I mean, we, we went to pick what was already under debate in the past. That's why we, we have all these pillars around what we call the precursors and precursors of degrowth, uh, pioneers of degrowth. So when we go f far in, in the past, and I think we should keep in mind that uh, it's not new. So yeah, we, we, are, we, we are late, but we shouldn't, because we are late, we shouldn't implement something which would make the situation, because we are in emergency, worse. And uh, when I was an engineer, I used to, to have a position when I was responsible of the train security of a large train station in Paris. And once I learned with that position, managing everyday tragedies, catastrophes, train accidents, somebody committing suicide, uh, no train, Tens of thousands of people going to the station who want to fight because uh, it's Christmas, there is no trains, they want to go to their family and so on. What I learned while working with emergency crews that when you face an emergency, what we are facing, the biggest mistake you can do is in the name of the emergency to start to, r to run everywhere. The first things you have to do is to slow down. And to be quick, you have to slow down, which is very counterintuitive. And I remember the first time I was in charge, I was very young, incompetent, and experienced, and so on. And I was in charge of the situation, and catastrophe, a suicide arrived, and it was a big mess. I started to run everywhere. And my colleague who was supervising me told me, stop your phone, take a coffee, and a cigarette. <laughs> and, I s and I think it's all what we have to do right now. In companies, everywhere. I mean, that's the story of of the Citizen Convention for Climate. They slowed down for seven weekends. And they made a paradigm switch, and they suggested in a democratic way a paradigm switch. So they slowed down, and it's been quick. But if we don't slow down, we will only cre create even more chaos on the chaos. And the same in the logic to organize always more conference, to publish always more in every direction, and so on. Do less but better. Slow down. Take time. Work on the quality of your activism, or uh, what you do and so on, and not the quantity. And um, the other point, yes, we are late, but I really believe that we are a bit in front of two choices which won't be decided in a binary way, but more like it will be 40, 50, or we don't know. The first one which been winning in the last decade is time we had a shock 
in our in our society was what Naomi Klein called the uh, how is it in uh, French uh, in in English the shock uh, shock doctrine called the shock doctrine and because you have the critical mass because you had the media because you have the imaginary which were hacked by the neoliberal politics ideology each time we got a shock the society went even further in ultra liberalism and I think that no considering that the fact that the imaginary within our society is not so much dominated anymore, and it's maybe more and more dominated by degrowth and not neoliberalism narratives. When a shock ha happens, you have a bigger chance that more the solidarity, more the uh, uh, step aside toward degrowth and so on would emerge, rather than authoritarianism, barbarity, violence, closing the borders, etc. And um, we could see it in time of COVID. In time of COVID, we saw how much informal solidarities, in particular in Western societies, helped a lot because the imaginary was somewhere else. We saw that because you already had these dynamics uh, toward this question within the society, the first confinement was an opportunity for a lot of people to go into a personal introspection about why do I waste my life with this bushy job? What really matters? Because of this work was made before and so on. And I have this image. We are constructing, we are like about to fall high in the air, trying to hold ourselves in, in something which is collapsing and we are falling one after the other one. Our civilization is already under collapse. And under, with degrowth and other movements, we try to construct a net. And the more we will construct nets, in this net, the less we will abandon people, and the more we will have a chance as large group to don't fall too violently. And uh, even if it's too late, we have to do it because that's the best solution what we can implement at this stage towards that. About your second question, we have a situation in France, which is a bit idiotic, that uh, all the mass medias, like everywhere in the world, are owned by oligarchs, in particular by by the, um, the military-industrial complex. But most of the journalists are quite uh, friends to degrowth. So they are fighting, and we work with them to fight, to time to time try to publish an article on degrowth. I will just give you an example where uh, No Liberation, which used to be a left uh, newspaper, not as influential as it used to be, but it's still there and so on. Uh, the new boss is a guy who just wrote idiotic fake news book about the beauty of, uh, of green growth, how green growth will save us, and so on. And the journalists I'm working with are now fighting with their boss to convince him and their bosses that, uh, look, all the society is speaking about degrowth. We have to publish something consistent, serious on degrowth. So it's still not done, but we are fighting. And uh, there is nothing which is more like a sheep than a journalist. So when one starts to publish something in one topic, they are all following. And that the strategy was we keep on implementing, that we try to make some uh, political coup. That, and degrowth is a good, it's a good tool to, to go into the media. And if you manage to make one or two key medias, whatever the country, all of them after we publish about that, without understanding whether it makes sense or not. And it's the same with the politicians. They are following the wind and so on. But it's, um, I think, one of the key challenge and blockades for degrowth, the media system in the hand of the oligarchy. Also, um, media systems with type of um, format, which are not good for this type of meaningful controversies. I mean, you need time. I'm, it's what I said, and on one of the uh, mainstream uh, news channel, where all day long you only see idiotic things, accidents, violence, insecurity, constructing um, fear and hatred in, in the French society. Suddenly they decided to give two hours, more than two hours, live, with two million people, with a smart de debate on ecofeminism and, and degrowth. It, so it, it's what you have to push to find where to, to go there. But it's one of the main blockades because it doesn't happen enough. And the other blockade is uh, social networks, which are enclosing the people in their own bubble of truth through uh, algorithms which were designed to optimize uh, uh, advertisement profits. And the problem is that you create a type of society where everybody constructs a different imaginary. We don't talk anymore. 
We don't know how to deal conflictualities, and you construct a um, society which is uh, based on, I would say, uh, civil war dynamics because you don't talk and you don't have a place to, to solve the conflict. And, th and that's why democracy is important there. And, and maybe, and I'm thinking about it, and no, I'm, I have, uh, I'm getting crazy, and it's something you enjoy because it plays with your uh, hormones, you know, uh, dopamine. You know, uh, so social networks are constructed with dopamine. So yeah, yeah I have my last radio show, and I am d intellectually distant with that, and I see that I go to look how many likes, how many shares of dopamine. And, 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 and I see how toxic it is on the people and so on, and I think that um, Degro should uh, open these debates and other movements, but maybe sooner or later, and, and maybe tomorrow, we should start to think, okay, go out of these social networks and go to talk with the people around you, and it should be uh, one of the steps, because here we have a strong blockade with, with both, and the media in the end of oligarchy, and social network in the end of so-called artificial intelligence, and uh, choosing for us what we can see and what we do, and, and closing us in our bubble. Uses to translate your decroissance as degrowth, but keeps saying DK. Um, <laughs> and you know, however much we correct the translation, it keeps coming back to DK. But uh, thank you for this great overview and summary, uh, as always. But uh, coming from a position right. of where we are today, um, you're still talking about experiences of white Western people with good education disillusioned with their shitty jobs not about a Serbian emigre trying to raise her child uh, in the West and only hoping for a bigger apartment. And in that sense, um, even with the tools, we, you mentioned property, but maybe not enough, and I'd like to hear more. We didn't touch capital. Who, in the end, owns the capital, which, according to Piketty, is bringing in more income than the work income? And that's why my question is, um, why the the taking power without taking power or creating cultural dynamics to remove the need for power from governing rather than Malm's ecological Leninism, given the severity and given the fact that we also need to govern with what's already on the planet. We need to work with the capital that's there. So I forgot your first point because uh, it's always the same and I directly uh, tackle the second one, but you will remind me for the first point after I, I tackle the second one. So I. About property, uh, I think we should relaunch squat movements. I used to be uh, in the squat movement in Paris for a year. I was among the people who participated in the launch of the uh, ZAD, Zona Defendre in Notre Dame des Landes. And I think it's more and more what we should go to. And in particular for the younger generation, we should provide them economic security, what they don't have, that they don't have to accept bullshit job or they don't have to be stressed about what what they can do, but it's not enough. We should also say that to construct the new world with this new generation who uh, understand the challenges that we have and we should experiment alternatives to the world that we have, we should also say, okay, uh, give this large space, this factory where we produce useless things we don't need anymore, give them that space and see what they do with that space. How they will turn it into a uh, low-tech industry for bike, how they will turn it into a large forum for theater, how they will turn it into a, a, a greenhouses for gardening and so on. But we need, and I can see how the trainees who are visiting us in Cargonomia are suffering from the lack of spaces to experiment alternatives. About your Serbian friends going to do the job uh, uh, to care about our parents and hospital in, in Western Europe and so on. I would say that if there is no degrowth in Western Europe, if people like me don't implement degrowth in Western Europe, we will keep up this type of uh, semi-peripheric uh, global south exploitation which will be underway. So the first condition for these people here in global south to re reappropriate their self-determination, the first condition is degrowth in the global north degrowth of the exploitation, all the technical, material, human uh, solidarities, what they have with us to make us consume a lot of things that we don't need and to push them to accept ways of life that they wouldn't maybe decide if they are appropriate self-determination. After up to them to decide what they want to do when they are appropriate self-determination. Um, my question... 
My question was actually related. To, um, we talk, uh, we, there's a lot of talk about the general um, principles and the political aspect, but uh, I see less clarity about the details of an alternative economic model. Uh, what will happen with the jobs for these masses? For what is with production? What is with uh, finance? Uh, and how will this transformation will be um, organized? Maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so I start uh, first jobs. Uh, no, we live in a society when we created this narrative. In, in Latin languages, I am very well to, to, to show how stupid it is because for two centuries in Latin languages, we switched from uh, oeuvre. I even don't know how to how to, uh, to translate it into English. It's like nice production, what you do. We switch to travail, which comes from tripalium, a tool for torture. And, and, and for two centuries, we have a view of work which is totally sick, with a division of work, with the idea that eight hours every day, you disconnect your brain, you disconnect your heart, and you give eight hours every day of your life to do something you don't know what, you don't know whether it makes sense or not. You don't know whether it's emancipatory for you or not. You don't know if you enjoy it or not, and so on. So for a while, a large majority of the people were in it, and it had positive cultural, human, social impact. Now all the studies about that are showing that work became really a tripalium. And we should rethink that. We should rethink not forced employment, but emancipatory shows on beautiful activities. And I say not activity, activities. And it's what we are experimenting in our cooperative in Budapest, where a typical day, I could have some time when I walk in the bike shop repairing bike, or at one of the garden in the city or at the farm working on agriculture. I have time where I am doing this type of exercise, debating on society issues. I have time where I will just sleep, have a, have a siesta, or spend time with my son, and spend time with my wife, or with friends, riding bicycle, having a coffee talk, and so on. I have time when we will organize a uh, festival, time where we will uh, participate in solving the conflicts, uh, time when uh, we will write books. And it doesn't mean that everybody sh will have to do exactly the same in sharing the things like that, but to rethink the society in how to share the hard task. And I, I, I switch to your third point. It's about that. So uh, like with unconditional basic income, a lot of people will leave a lot of bullshit job. And if they leave it, it means that they were even toxic, useless, or so much humiliating in the way they were organized that we should rethink how do we organize this job. Like, uh, you provide unconditional basic income, and all the people what we humiliate in hard tasks, which are fundamental for our societies, but they have bad, bad working condition, bad, uh, bad salaries, also humiliating. We don't provide self-esteem to what they do, because like people cleaning the offices in La Défense in Paris, it's organized in a way that they go to work early morning, that they never met with the people who work in La Défense. And so they will leave their job. And these big guys, they will arrive in their office, say, what the fuck? My office is clean. It was, it's not clean anymore. It was clean for years, and I don't know who was doing it, what was happening, and so on. So it will push the society to uh, public deliberation about, yeah, there was these things that we were looking down at the people. They were doing something important. No, they don't do it anymore, because we are made it in them so much that they don't. So how do we reorganize the things? Do we promote these jobs so much that we create new type of symbolic promotion of their work, that when they go to work, we are all there to applaud them and be thankful to them? We gi will we give them higher salary? We will say that, uh, that it's totally crazy. Why do I need somebody cleaning my, uh, my own shit? Self-organization, we all do it together. So it will push for this type of logic. And one example of uh, experimentation we have in, in Budapest with our farm, where in the farm you have a lot of fun, a lot of good time, it's beautiful, you have the rom more and more the romantic narrative around that, but to be honest, it's also a lot of hard work, physical work, which is even more difficult for people like 
like me or my trainees who are, we welcome, who are educated to be sitting in front of a computer. And I'm always laughing that if we take the uh, old colleagues of the farm, uh, been working all along their life in the farm, and we make them sit as much as us in front of the computer, they will have very painful back, as much we have painful back when we first go to work at the farm and so on. And um, we think about when we have our tasks to do, how to organize it in a way that it's not only the same people doing all along their life, 10 hours per day, the same hard task, where they break their back, where they suffer, where they are mediating with that, but we share the task. And also, Nicolas Georges Kourogan, one of the fathers of Degros, has this sentence. A hard task made alone, you suffer a lot. A hard task shared in a convivial way, you can turn it into a good time. And we had, for example, an agroforestry project when we needed to, to plant in one day 800 trees. 800 trees is a lot of uh, work. And 800 trees, with the crew we have in the farm, they will have done it because they are experienced. They are very good workers. They know how to use the tools. They have the force and so on. But it will have been a tough day for them. It was November. It was raining. Uh, we had to do it on a Saturday. We didn't want to pay extra hours for that and so on. So what we did, we organized a festival. And why seeing performance or listening to music, drinking a beer and so on, everybody dig and you have your 800 trees. And you don't suffer. And it's one way to how to re decolonize our imaginary and rethink the society. And there was also one more question between one point, but I stop here. I need to give. Uh, I don't know, but we don't have. Okay. We don't have time, uh, uh, unfortunately, for more questions. Sorry, Sasha, you can ask later. But I'm please. still here, and uh, I have some copies of uh, books in French and in English. So come to me if you're interested in this book, and uh, it's uh, uh, how to say free price. I mean, you, you based on free donation. So you decide how much you want to give. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, Pedrek, for organizing it. And Sorry for being too long. Uh, thank you. We are continuing in one minute and we will talk about some tools which can lead us to degrowth.